importance of the hearing case studies was delineated by almost all their jurisdictions. We have uh, David Earp here from Zoyas. He's going to present a case study using Clarify. I'm just going to turn it over and let you go. Thanks a lot. We've heard a lot about different ways you can put genomic testing into practice. What we're going to go over here is a herd that went in, tested, and is now doing whole herd testing, how they evolved into that process and what they got out of the data that they found with genomic testing. First of all, I want to thank you for having this down here. I'm from Minnesota, so it was nice to fly someplace where it wasn't frozen. My wife and kids are very jealous. The herd that we're going to talk about here, it's a fourth generation family farm. They've been in business for over 90 years. There's 11 family members involved, 62 total employees. They milk 2,400 cows that are producing about 90 pounds per cow per day. They have over 5,000 acres that they farm. Uh, they've got multiple freestall barns, two milking parlors, special needs area, and assorted other barns to raise the calf. Now their decision to genomic test, it, the herd owner had prior experience with genomic testing. They started as a smaller registered Holstein herd and he had actually sold some bulls to AI so he was familiar with genomic testing some very elite animals out of his herd but hadn't stretched beyond just those few cow families for genomic testing. They went through an expansion on the dairy. In August of 2011, they decided to send in some samples for genomic testing after wanting to find out the calves from the animals they purchased, how much lower genetic levels were they than their own animals, as to kind of look at that as a decision to which animals they would keep and which animals they would not raise. They wanted firsthand experience using genomic data and seeing what they could get out of it. They went ahead and tested, and in September of 2011, they reviewed the first test results with us. We both noted there was gain in reliability on net merit from 21% up to 60%, and that half of the animals changed 100 net merit dollars, and 10% changed actually a fair bit over 200 net merit dollars. So they found that the animals did re-rank. So they kept testing those calves that were born out of purchased animals, and six months later, with six months of data, 670 heifers, that were tested, they decided to review what they were doing again with a larger management team from the farm and some industry people, their nutritionists, their reproductive specialists. And they looked, they saw that net merit reliability and now they were up to about 62%. And they found that they had 8% sire misidentification, which bothered them, but we tried to assure them that they were actually pretty good. But they also found that the recessives that were in the herd, that they had over 13% of the animals carried some sort of recessive, whether it was one of the haplotypes affecting fertility or one of the genetic recessives that were designated by the Holstein Association. With all that data, they also looked and historically they had sold some excess milk cows and springing heifers for dairy purposes. At that time in early 2012, there were very high feed costs and heifer values were not as high. That's changed now, but then when they were making that decision, they kind of looked at when it would be best to sell those excess animals and they figured out that they need a higher springing heifer price to cover the cost than what the market was able to support at that time. So in April 2012, they decided to sell their first four month old calf after genomic testing. 
they decided to test all the heifers born on the farm that were born after Christmas Day 2011. And then they would sell the low-end ranking young stock at four months of age using a spreadsheet so that they could keep a constant flow of replacements coming in to keep the milking herd up to capacity. They developed their own selection index based mostly on net merit dollars, cheese merit dollars, and with their little bit of registered background, they wanted to have a little more emphasis on udders and feet and legs in the herd. Worked on an index that supported their selection decisions. They used the information that they got back on the genomic test results with their AI provider, with their mating program. That way they could look at the strengths and weaknesses of each of the animals that came back with that mating program and make those animals accordingly. They plan to review the results again once those first genomic tested animals started coming in to make sure they were doing the right thing. The first thing they got back when they did the whole herd, all the animals that were born, they found that their sire miss IDs were about 7.8%. And they found that 1% of those they could tra trace to bull breedings that were either marked as unknowns or were ones that were marked as AI breedings that they were wrong that it was actually a bull breeding. They found 12 cases where they appeared to switch animals at birth, and the remaining mistakes likely revolved around their synchronization day where, as we said, the inseminator goes out and did the right straw of semen getting the right cow, or the other end is, did they record it right? Did those things happen? And for them, it, the 7.8% bothered them immensely, and we were trying to convince them that you're well below the national average. What we find is the smaller herds that we test have very low miss IDs because you don't have as many events happening at the same time. The larger the herds get, the higher the percent of miss IDs go. But they were also impressed that the, their third best net merit animal that they found in genomic testing was one that was misidentified at birth. So in a herd like this, where they do some embryo transfer work, this was a valuable animal that they were going to flush. And if they hadn't genomic tested, they would have never found that animal to be one of their top ones. It would have, they thought it was one that was in the lower part of the herd, but they had misidentified that animal. The national average is around 14 to 15% sire misidentification, but I've seen herds that are really high on misidentification. I've seen some that are 75 to 80 percent incorrect. There's an opportunity with genomic testing. If the if the sire is an AI sire, genomic testing will identify who the sire is. And for those that are registered, like in this herd, we provide them with that information but they have to contact the breed association to correct the ID so that it goes through the evaluation system correctly. They also noted when they were getting results back from the whole herd that their heifers that they tested, the parent average is now up to 24% because with their home bred, the, the heifers from their own animals with fuller pedigrees to get them a little higher for net merit reliability on parent average of 24%, and that their genomic net merit reliabilities were now up to 66%. So much more accuracy with the genomic estimates. And this was what they were after when they first started testing, is the red bars are the heifer calves born out of the purchased animals, and the blue bars are the ones, the heifer calves that originated from their own animal. And they found the difference of 107 net merit dollars between the two groups. And to them, they were very pleased with this because they had spent a lot of money over the years investing in genetics in the herd, doing embryo transfer, buying better bulls, and 
to them, they would have been disappointed if these two groups came out very close because to them, they, they kind of knew the animals they were buying, there wasn't as much put into their genetics. To them, they were pleased with these results. We looked at with them the parent average for net merit versus genomic values. And if everything was perfect, they'd all fit right along this red line. But we see that some got a good sort of genes and some got a poorer sort of gene. You can see that we had quite a bit of re-ranking and distribution among the results. Now, the next slide gets a little more complicated. This is basically looking at the variation that we found, the re-ranking of the animals in the herd. If everything was perfect, all the animals would fit on this dark green line in the middle. And what we consider is anything that fit on this diagonal or the two faces, the two areas next to there were basically ones that ranked pretty close to the same whether from their parent average versus their genomic test. And they're roughly 49% in that group. If we look on the left here, we've got parent average in deciles from the worst group to the best group and their genomic test from the worst group to the best group. So we're looking at here in this blocked off area is the worst ones for parent average and net merit dollar. And what this says is that if we were just looking at parent average, these would be the animals that this herd would have called. And this group in here, they would have been right. And that's about, again, 49% fell in that range. But we had a multitude of other ones that ended up being a lot higher we even had three of them that got into the top 10% of the herd. So these are animals that we look at and say these were potential flush animals. And this group would have definitely been services to sex semen and some of these multiple services to sex semen that we would have gotten rid of if we just used parent average as our culling tool. Likewise, these are the animals that we ended up calling. And you see some of these we get down here are ones that if we just use parent average, we would have maybe flushed this animal or bred these to sex semen to get more calves and put more of these genetics into the herd. That these are ones we would have invested more in that Genomics tells us their genetics aren't good enough to put that investment in. Now, these are the top end animals from genomic testing. And where did they come from? You can see that we did have quite a few that came from the bottom half of the herd from parent average. So they got, they're the ones that got that good distribution of genes. And from parent average, we see that some of the ones we thought would be best. We've got one that would have been in a group that we would have considered flushing, and she's one that we need to need to find a new home, find a new career, because she's not going to be a profitable cow. And we've got others that are in the lower end that we thought would be ones that we'd invest quite a bit in. So there's different mistakes we can make by what ones that we invest in that we shouldn't, and some we don't invest in that we should have. One of the questions I get asked quite often is, how much variability do we have in our, with selecting for genomics? Because you think about it, selecting for genomics, we're trying to select for those best genes at each site. So we're kind of narrowing the base a little bit, but what does genomic testing do for our uh, distribution versus just looking at parent average. And what we find among that top 10% group that we're working with, if we look at those, that group, the number of sires represented using parent average only, we had 80 sires represented in that group that had the top 10% for net merit. Whereas our genomic tested animals, we had 106 different sires represented. So we 
actually had more different sires represented with the genomic group. We look at the bulls that had the most daughters, the, bull, the top 10 bulls with the most daughters. There were 150 daughters in that group with parent average and only 118 in that group with the genomic estimate. And the top bull for the number of daughters had 33 with the parent average group and only 16 for the ones that are genomic tested. So we had more of a variety of pedigrees among that group that was in the top 10% when we genomic tested. Now we always know, we always hear that the old adage was the heifers that are born this year are better than the ones that are born last year. And that is true if we're making genetic progress, but not every heifer is better than the year before. This is the distribution of the herd heifers that were born in 2010 that they tested. There's 2011. We can see that our average moves to the right some, so they're improving because this is net merit dollars on the bottom and the frequency on the side. 2012, they started testing all the animals born on the farm. So we get more animals tested, but we can see that the average still moves off to the right. There's 2013 and partial of 2014 for the first half of the year. And what we can see here is we shade off. This is your bottom third of the heifers born in 2012. So these be your two year olds that are in production. You can still see there's some 2014 heifers that fall below what the average is for the two year olds that are in the herd. Also, we can look at the top end here as far as the ones that they're flushing. We can see that, yes, there are some elite heifers born in 2014 up here, but we also have a few 2013 and a couple two-year-olds that are up in this range, too, that deserve some embryo transfer work, which the herd does. So now they have milking daughters in the herd from genomic testing. So they wanted to see what kind of response are we getting? Are we, are we identifying the better animals? This slide is a slide of the original genomic estimate for milk on the x-axis and the y-axis is their first lactation ME milk projection here. And what we expect to see is for every pound of PTA milk we increase, we should see two pounds of milk production here because you think about it, if PTA is what they transmit, they'll actually show double that. And this herd, their slope on this line, expect to, they got about 3.2 pounds for every pound. So what that tells us is the herd has pretty good management because they're getting more from their genetics than what we expect. Their heritability estimate for the herd are actually a little bit higher because they're controlling the environment a little bit better than the average. But the really key statistic that we're looking for here is the R squared value. How much of the variability can we explain with the genomic estimate? And we've got about 16.5% of the variability we can explain with the genomic estimate. Now, when we look at the parent average estimate, looking at parent average milk versus the production, we see more variability. Yes, we have a slope, it's about the same, which tells us that the herd responds to genetic selection very well, but our R squared value is just over 6%, which is a lot less than the previous slide showed, which we had 16.5%. So much more of the variance was explained with genomic estimate, which tells us they were much more accurate. Now putting it on a selection basis, let's say we call the bottom 10% 
and we target the top 10% for multiple services to sex semen or embryo transfer or things like that, which selection tool would yield the best? On the top, we have parent average, and we can see that the lowest group for parent average, they were right at the lowest, but our best performing decile was actually one that was in the middle, had the best milk, and our top end was probably the second best decile. But the difference between the best and worst was about 2,800 pounds of milk. Using genomic estimates, our highest predicted group was the highest for milk production, and our lowest was the lowest. Our slope was much steeper with the genomic estimate than the parent average estimate. And we got about double the difference between our best and worst group using the genomic estimate. So a lot more difference between that best and worst. So we're calling, if we call that bottom 10%, we're calling more of the correct animal. But we're here to talk about lower heritable traits and how they respond to genomic selection. So the first trait I'd like to tackle in that area would be somatic cell score. And genomics actually works a lot better on the low heritable traits. We gain a lot more reliability with those than looking at traits that are highly heritable like milk production. Yes, we gain reliability on those, but on a percentage basis, we gain much more on the lower heritable traits. This slide here, we've got the genomic estimates in the blue and the parent average estimates are in the red, and you can see that it's much more uniform on the response we get on somatic cell score for first lactation versus the groups. We put them in quintiles, so five equal distributed groups from best to worst for somatic cell. But looking at it on the occurrence of mastitis, based on genomic estimates, we can see that the group that we thought would be best for somatic cell score actually had the least amount of occurrence of mastitis, and the group that we predicted to be the worst had the highest occurrence of mastitis. Selecting for somatic cell score on genomic estimates would get us some progress on the occurrence of mastitis. Another trait that we looked at, and in this herd made some sense for them, was a trait called daughter stillbirth. This herd does a lot of embryo transfer, and their plan was to take those embryos from those elite animals and put them in the worst genetic animals that they were keeping. And this information that we presented to them had them think about what exactly, which animals <coughs> should they put those embryos in. The Holstein breed has an issue with daughter stillbirth. The breed averages close to 8 to 9 percent of the calves born are dead. And we've got genomic estimates on daughter stillbirth. Some of the lowest ones we get are around the 4 percent range, and we go all the way up to some very high ones. And what we concentrated on were the majority we found were between four and nine on their daughter stillbirth ratings. And we looked at those as to looking at the farm records, how many stillborn calves did they get out of each of these? And you can see that the low groups, they got less than 10%, but they kept creeping up. And the ones that we consider high, they were getting up over 20% and 30% stillbirth. What the we found with the farm was, okay, you put all the investment into getting these embryos out of these animals. Let's screen the recipients for daughter stillbirth. Let's put it in that lower group that's lower for daughter stillbirth. And let's avoid putting embryos in those that are higher. And we, they had some that even went up to 10, 11, 12 on daughter stillbirth, and you can see that their stillbirth rate got over 50% on some of those. Now, it's not a lot of animals, 
and that's why you don't you want to put that on there. But it gave them another way that they could use the genomic information to help them make more live calves out of the animals that they wanted. So we talked about daughter pregnancy rate, DPR. In this farm, we wanted to look at genomic estimates for daughter pregnancy rate versus the pregnancy rates they actually got in the herd. This herd, they averaged 78 days waiting period for first lactation animals. So we looked at all the animals that had been genomic tested, and they averaged 19% pregnancy rate in this herd. We looked at all the genomic estimates for daughter pregnancy rate for the cows that were less than or equal to zero, and their pregnancy rate was 16%. We looked at the genomic daughter pregnancy rate of those that were positive to plus 1.4. The pregnancy rate for that group jumped to 21%. And if their genomic estimate for daughter pregnancy rate was greater than or equal to 1.5, their pregnancy rate jumped to 26%. And like we mentioned, there's some economics you can put with that. You can see that these animals that have the higher pregnancy rates are much more profitable animals. But the key message here is genomic estimates for daughter pregnancy rate, if you make a selection for that, you can improve the reproduction efficiency of your herd. Another trait we looked at was heifer conception rate. Now, heifer conception rate is now in the net merit formula. It's probably the lowest heritable trait we select for in that formula. It's 1% heritability. We wanted to look at their herd and look at heifer conception rate, which is on the bottom here. We kind of group them versus services per conception, the times they bred these heifers. And what we found is the animals that were the poorest for uh, heifer conception rate, we had over 1.7 services per conception. And the better the heifer conception rate got, the lower the services per conception. And if the heifers had a heifer conception rate of 2.0 or higher, their services per conception were less than 1.3. So we find that these low heritable traits we can make some selection for. Now, if you looked at parent average for heifer conception rate, I think your reliabilities would be right around 10%. And if you genomic test, we can raise that reliability up close to 50%. So you definitely gain quite a magnitude in reliability with a low heritable trait like heifer conception rate. After reviewing some of this data, the decisions that they made First of all, they revised their customer ranking on their index. They put in a lot more for reproduction into the index. They also de decided to work on the amount of sex semen to use in the upper ranking heifers and using some in the cows. So they'd be able to breed some of the lower ranking animals, especially the cows in the herd to some beef bulls. And what they found with this, now they're starting to get those to calve in and just talk to the herd owner here a couple months ago. They're not getting as many of those beef calves as they thought they would. And the reason why is they're their lower end genetic animals. They're the ones that are getting called out of the herd at a higher rate. And so they're not getting as many calves, which they weren't disappointed in, but it was interesting to note that. Earlier this year, they talked to a few other farmers that were doing some genomic testing. One of them was doing partial genomic testing, just testing the bottom 20%. And they test, talked to another farmer that was actually looking at using average daily gain information on heifer calves to predict which calves he keep. And he wanted to, he had information on his calves for average daily gain. So he wanted to take a look and see what would I be better off doing. So we analyzed that data for him and found that the best economic model was to continue with whole herd testing, that just testing 
the bottom 20% trying to figure out who are the real duds. He was still making too many mistakes on which animals he'd be culling. He would find that some of the better animals in the herd he'd cull and he'd miss some of them that would be the worst. So he wouldn't get as much benefit out of the genomic testing. And average daily gain, well, it is, it does help us identify which animals were healthier as young animals. It really didn't have much effect on which animals gave more milk as cows for selecting a percentage to call off that strategy. Their plan forward is to sell the bottom end of the animals they test. The lower value cows and a few of the lower value heifers, they put beef in, or else these would be recipients for their embryo transfer. The top half of the heifers would be bred to sex semen. They've expanded that into breeding some of the cows, better genetic cows to sex semen too. And uh, some of the data that we've gotten from sexing technologies is that their new uh, sex ultra semen is they're finding that that conception rate is 97% of conventional semen, so that they're not losing as much in the conception rate as we were maybe five years ago when we used sex semen, that the technology is improving. And in this herd, they, like, they are accustomed to doing some ET work, and genomic testing is ideal for them to identify which animals to uh, go ahead and do the embryo transfer work and maybe do some IVF work with also, but it also has provided them with uh, an idea of which, which animals are recipients for those eggs too, is a big part. So that's a lot of data that you get with genomic testing. The question is, how do you manage all this data that comes in? You've got daughter stillbirth, you've got daughter pregnancy rate, pepper conception rate, milk fat protein, you've got all sorts of traits. So Edis, along with the Holstein Association and a 50-50 partnership, has come up with NLight. And NLight is a comprehensive data management tool. It helps dairy producers optimize their genetic improvement and the investment that they've made in genomic technology by providing a web-based access to their genetic information at any time. It's updated after every genetic evaluation and farmers can look up the data at this website on their animals at any time. It's exclusively for Holstein customers and it provides a, a view of their herd level genetics and individual animal genetic performance. And it gives you the resources necessary to translate the genomic information into effective selection, management, and mating decisions. And you can measure your progress that you're making genetically within the herd and against the Holstein breed. And it gives you some powerful reports that uh, are helpful to your herd progress. This is a chart of the herd that we then discussing here, this is for net merit, and you can do this for milk, fat, protein also, but you can see the black line is the breed average and the blue line is the herd average. You can see that they were going about the same progress as the breed was until they started partial genomic testing. You can see off the selection, they could improve that rate slightly and then they started testing all the calves born in 2012 and you can see the progress they've made at that point compared to the breed has exploded and what i tell farmers that we look at this information is this is a profit trade if you're progressing slower than the breed is you're becoming less profitable than the average herd out there. This is kind of a, a report card in a sense, is that this herd can look and say, 
genetically, we're set up for success. We're improving at a rate faster than the breed average is. You can do it for other traits too. This is daughter pregnancy rate. You can see that the herd really didn't have much selection for daughter pregnancy rate. And when they started genomic testing, they this trait was pointed out to them. They decided to put more emphasis on daughter pregnancy rate. And now we can see that they're well above the breed average for their genetics on daughter pregnancy rate. What you see is a distribution and it show you the bell-shaped curve. You can also do some scatter plots with this information. We've talked about the relationship between milk and reproduction, and you can plot out these traits for the animals that have been genomic tested. So you can see on here for this herd, it's almost 4,000 animals, and you can see the slight downward trend as the higher you get for daughter pregnancy rate, the lower for milk production. But if you go into the screen, you can hover over each of these animals that are kind of outliers, that are high for daughter pregnancy rate, but also high for milk, and it will tell you who these animals are. It'll give you their identification information. You can look up and say, hey, these are outliers that maybe I need to take a better look at. But it also gives you the availability to create your own custom selection index. You can rank animals on that index so that you don't have to look at a lot of traits. You can rank them out and say, who are my best ones? Who are my worst ones? These are the ones I want to deal with. Where's the line that I want to make for deciding which ones get sex semen or not? The last thing I want to go over here is this is a different herd, but it's just a herd that has done a lot of selection on genomics and for net merit. And we wanted to look at the worst group that they had for uh, net merit and the best group. We tested 240 animals and they didn't do any culling. They didn't use this information for culling. They just wanted to see how long these animals would last. And the group that we identified as the worst for net merit, the ones that would be least profitable or the ones that would cause the most problems, after three and a half years, they only had about 13% of them left in the herd. Whereas the group that was identified the best from genomics for net merit, after three and a half years, there's still 15% of them left in the herd. So quite a difference there from genomic selection. If they would have made it earlier on, just think of, they could have gotten rid of a lot of headaches and concentrated more on making this, this group reproduce. In summary, the clarified test that Zoetis offers gives you the ability to proactively and more accurately predict an animal's future profit potential. You definitely achieve higher levels of reliability, especially for low heritable traits. You can rank young animals with confidence and prioritize them for breeding and management decisions. And you can make progress for traits that are important to each herd, whether they fall into the production type or fitness traits. And light gives us the ability to easily manage and utilize the data that you get back. And as you can see from these examples, real herds are using this data to improve their efficiency and their profits. Now it's your turn.